is Owen Guthrie, and I work for the University of Alaska Fairbanks e-learning and distance education. And this uh, session uh, is brought to you today by uh, e-learning and distance education. Alex St. John is with us from New Zealand, and his presence here today is paid for uh, by University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, they put on last Friday a games-oriented conference about uh, games and education called Series Fun, and we have a special <coughs> thank you to uh, Dave Dannenberg and Jeanette Renovino for facilitating Alex's presence here. So as I mentioned earlier, Alex St. John, welcome. Come on in. I'm the eighth last cookie, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Alex St. John uh, was a student here himself in the late 80s, early 90s, or the late 80s. Uh, he was a student on campus, a CS student, um, and went on to become an uh, illustrious figure at um, Microsoft, one of the creators of DirectX. Notorious. Notorious is the best word, <laughs> yeah. Um, and has had a diverse and uh, somewhat legendary career in the computer games industry and the software industry in general. So um, most of you, many of you were here earlier, so I'm not going to go into the details. I want you to be able to talk to Alex as much as you want. But um, if you're interested in finding out more about Alex, he's got a very active blog on the internet. I suggest you read there. It's got all kinds of humorous uh, and lurid details of his life from inside Microsoft and also conversations about uh, Microsoft products and other products in the industry. So um, without further ado, Alex St. John. Thank you, Juan. Also, as Juan mentioned to you guys, so this is a little open forum here. I'm not going to do slides because you know, this is a nice, small enough group that we go, okay, let's talk about how we're going to get you guys employed and get you the kind of careers you want to have. And frankly, if you're delusional, shatter those delusions, crush your dreams so that you can rebuild realistic ones that you can actually achieve, which is one of my favorite things to do with young people. Because um, <laughs> it happens to me many times. Um, so as Owen tells you, I... Uh, I'm from Alaska. I grew up in the bush out here for 16 years. Log cabin, no running water, no plumbing, no electricity. So when I was growing up as a kid, there was no video games, no media, and uh, you know, when you got up in the morning, you could sit quietly in a dark cabin for 14 hours and hope that somebody fed you and kept you warm and and you know, got your water. And the outhouse was 300 yards away, and it was 60 below out. And uh, so frankly, the way you grow up is just trying to survive every day. And they, doesn't matter what your age you were, you're out scooping up snow, bringing it in, melting on the pot. You're out hauling wood, chipping it with an axe out of the frozen thing. It's keeping the fire going. You're waking up at 3 a.m. because if your cabin dropped below a certain temperature at 3 a.m., your family froze to death. You had to get keep logs in that fire all the time. You had three months of summer to gather all the food you would need for the winter, all the berries, all the moose, all the dead animal you could collect, nine cords of wood, which would fill about half of this room, and the kids got to split it and stack it all by the house, and then you spent the rest of your winter shoveling it in for nine months to survive in your cabin. And then I got to go back to society when I was 16 and got dropped into a regular high school, which I adjusted to extremely well by dropping out. Uh, <laughs> So one of the weird things coming from my background is how many of you are actually native Alaskans here that is born here? All right. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Maybe your upbringing wasn't as rugged as mine, but I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you have a huge cultural advantage if you want to go down to the lower 48 and look for a job. Just because even coming from anywhere near this kind of lifestyle, your upbringing is going to be a lot more work-centric than it is down in the States. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm going to express a strict, extreme attitude to help communicate with you guys because I, knowing I grew up working. And when I moved down to the States, it was really hard for me to adjust. One is there's nothing to do. There is no work that needs to be done. Water brings itself into your house. Light comes when you throw a switch. Heat just radiates from things. And if you're bored, you push a button and, and entertainment happens. You don't have to go outside and find a pine cone and a rock and a stick to knock around. You, you just, it arrives there. So it was very hard to me to just doing nothing. And over, just to give you a perspective, years later when I'm an accomplished employer hiring people and I'm hiring kids who come up from that culture, there's nothing harder for me to grasp or deal with than, than the lower 48 view of work. Because work where I come from is painful and backbreaking and always miserable, and nothing is rewarding about it except you didn't die. <laughs> but in the lower 48, 
work is something you can or cannot do, and you'll be okay tomorrow for some reason, because stuff will be taken care of even if you don't take care of things yourself. And a lot of kids grow up there never having gotten a blister or a cut or dug a ditch or chopped a log or doing anything strenuous. And so when they're dropped into high-tech workforce, the idea of sitting, I need a prop here. Oh, oh my eyes, off a carpal tunnel. Oh, I need a break, it's too much work. So you'd get this mind-boggling notion that there was any amount of sitting at a desk moving a mouse and blinking once in a while. That could ever be called work or strenuous. Ever! And so you literally have this, you have this guy, I need a break, I've just been concentrating all day. Just the work, I'm so stressful, all the work with it. You know, none of this is ever work. No amount of sitting on your ass, barely moving a mouse, is ever work. It may be a little tedious, but that's still not compared to moving logs in the freezing cold and, and it being tedious in addition to that. So one of the hardest things I had adjusting to was that my idea of what was work compared to what most people grew up perceiving as work was orders of magnitude apart. <clears throat> and I go, hey, I am really fortunate to have an unusually high IQ and to have lots of talent. I'm really happy about that. But actually, I knew lots of people who were really smart Maybe some of them were smarter than me, not that I would admit that. But boy, I kicked their ass when it came to getting anything done. Because when other people go, I, I'm slightly bored. I'm, uh, oh, it's a little inconvenient. You know, that was a really exciting idea 15 minutes ago, but now that I face actually shipping it, I, I'm kind of losing interest here. I've got to make an excuse to work on something. You should take care of that for me, because I have something new and important that needs to be done over here. And you'd see that constantly now. So it's just people just, just the ability to finish and tough it out and get something done was insurmountable to them. And so my most useful secret to my success superpower was in addition to, you know, being a little bright and talented, was my work ethic and my ability to get things done, no matter how dirty, how boring, how tedious it needed to happen, I tackled it. And so what I will tell you now is another Alaskan, when I went down there, and to give you a little perspective, again, no education. I never graduated from high school. I took a little, uh, spent a year and a half here at the University of the CS and E engineer because I tested in. And they said, you, you don't have a high school degree, so you're going to have to blow it out on an SAT and ACT. So you know what I did? I spent three months studying my ass off until I aced those things and handed the engineering department there, go, can I get college, please? And then uh, I got a job down in the States, and I go, oh, I kind of need money, and the university isn't paying me that much, so... I took a job in the industry, and a few years later, I ended up hired by Microsoft in a very key technology and strategy position with no education. And so when I arrived at Microsoft campus, I was sitting there going, God, and I was very young. I didn't know why they had hired me. I mean, I was excited. I was proud. But I was surrounded by nothing but computer science majors, AAA, Stanford University, Caltech, top of their class geniuses, grew up in civilization. They... They were with all their graduate friends who they'd gone to high school with, all of them geniuses, all of them ex extremely seasoned in the industry. And I showed up at Microsoft and I was like, boy, I have no idea how I'm going to survive here. I don't understand a word they're saying. I don't know why they hired me or how I got in here. I'm glad they did, but I don't think that can last for very long because I am nothing like these guys. Well, as you guys may know, a few years later, I started the Skunk Works project with some friends, built the DirectX media architecture, we architected the Windows 95 print and, and graphics subsystems, invented Direct3D, and we also solved the operating system for the DirectX box. I now have 23 patents in streaming compression, digital media delivery, and interestingly, streaming mapping. Uh, the mapping patent, mapping maps you use on Google Maps were myself and my founder's invention at Wild Tangents. We sold them to Google for half a million dollars. Um, so I turned out to actually be very successful at Microsoft in spite of all of that. And I'll tell you exactly what got me there. It was the work attitude. I go, those guys, I'm sure those guys had better educational credentials, better degrees. But boy, could I outwork them. Boy, could I kick their butts when something needed to be get, get done. Boy, did my ego not get in the way of doing whatever it took to get my shit finished 
when those guys were like, I graduated magna cum laude, I don't rest, write test suites, that's somebody else's job. I did whatever it took. And that made me immensely successful. Um, one of the things I was told when I was there is I joined Microsoft in 92. I was the fastest Microsoft millionaire in history. And that is, not only did the stock go up at a very precipitous time, but I was granted options so fast for my work there that they compounded very rapidly. Uh, and then I left Microsoft and started Wild Tangent. And a lot of people left Microsoft and started companies during the dot-com era. A lot of people raised a lot of venture capital and started companies in that era. Wild Tangent was unique in one interesting way. Um, the dot-com era bubble burst when everybody did that. My company is one of the handful that survived and became successful. The rest all died. And the major reason the rest all died is because it became really hard to survive and to run a company and to keep it alive and to keep it funded when the entire economy had collapsed. And everybody else gave up because it was hard. And I didn't give up. I killed myself. It was brutal. But my company became successful. My investors survived. They kept their investments. When I want to raise money in Silicon Valley, I ask for it and I get it. So I've raised over $120 million for three companies that I've started over the years because VCs go, look, we know you're a little crazy. We know you don't have any formal education, but we also know if we give you our money, you're going to freaking do something with it and you're not going to blow it or give up because you have a bad day. So the first thing I will tell you Alaskans is that when you get out in the real world, if you wonder what your degree is worth, what your attitude is worth, what your skills are worth, what your talent's worth, they're all worth 1% of what your work ethic is worth. And so, and the thing I will tell you right off is whatever, if your upbringing wasn't as hard as mine, but you're from Alaska, if you go down to the States, you're going to look next to your right and your left, and you might see people who have better credentials or more experience or more of this stuff. Odds are they're not going to be able to compete with you when it comes to getting shit done if you just have a little of this experience up here. So if I were, if I was saying I'm going back to somebody telling me when I was a kid here, going, hey, Alex, you want a secret as to how that you're going to be successful one day? Lean on the work ethic. That's what's going to get you there. All that other stuff you're proud of and you're working hard to, it'll be helpful. It's nice to have. Lean on the work ethic. So that's the first thing, and that advice applies to everybody. Because I do everything. I, I do my accounting, my financing, my raising money. I write my own code. I handle the business model and engineering. Because the nice thing about a work ethic is you don't let your ego stop you from doing whatever needs to be done, get done, or learn whatever needs to get done to be successful. A lot of people go, I want it comfortable. I kind of want to just do this because it's fun. It's the thing I like. I just want a job that pays me to do that thing. And I kind of want to avoid any of that other stuff. That makes you a wage slave. If you want to be a wage slave and collect a good salary and have a senior job, that'll work okay. If you want to be the boss, if you want to move up, if you want to run companies and manage things, the attitude is, if it needs to get done, I do whatever it takes to get it done. And people who have that attitude go very far. I had an interesting experience with that recently. Um, having left Microsoft many years ago, um, as you know, Microsoft had a lot of very great and very competitive people. Uh, Microsoft has had very little leadership changeover in many, many years. Who's Microsoft's new CEO? Indian guy named Satya Nadella. Satya started out at Microsoft in the, about the same strategy developer relations group I did. So he came up through the ranks of Microsoft over 22 years. What's interesting about, about this guy, and I didn't know him well, I met him a couple times, uh, but what was interesting about him was that there were lots of people who would have given their right arm to have Steve Ballmer, Bill Gates' job. Lots of extremely talented, extremely capable people. The interesting thing about the choice of Satya in my mind was that of all the people they chose, they picked the guy who had the longest, most even-handed track record of just gunning out whatever he was handed at Microsoft without failing, without giving up, even if it was a bag of shit he had to deal with. And so what was interesting is when they chose a new CEO, they picked somebody that was rock solid, dependable, rock solid, reliable, first job criteria of all the other things that you could prioritize. So I found that was very interesting. So first message to you guys, if you're Alaskans, you're already starting with an advantage. I'm telling you what it is, okay? Second thing. So we're going to talk about jobs in general. How many of you are particularly interested in jobs in just the game industry as opposed to how do I succeed or get the kind of jobs I want to have in general? How many of you game industry? I want to see a few hands there. Okay, interesting. So how many of you guys want jobs uh, as founders or CEOs or leaders one day? 
You don't have to feel obligated to raise your hand. It's actually good if you don't. All right. How many of you say, look, I just want to be a great wage slave and get paid to do exactly what I want to do? <laughs> That's okay. I'm not, but I know what I am. I'm a megalomaniac, right? There's only room for a few of us in the world, and I need employees, so I'm perfectly happy to get those answers. But it is important to know what you are because it's different advice for different people. I'm telling all of you that work ethic is the core of it, uh, for a lot of it. Because, boy, is that rare and expensive to find in the U.S. So I'm going to tell you in high tech right now, when I hire new people right out of college, I give them variations on the same speech. One of them is going, well, welcome. The fact that I hired you in high tech means that if you flip jobs tomorrow, you might be able to double your salary just because I hired you. You can be completely useless and incompetent, but as soon as you put my name or any qualified high tech company has hired you on your resume, that's going to pre-qualify you for your next job pretty easily. Um, so don't be too proud of yourself for finding that once you've gotten in the door, things seem to get a lot easier. Um, that's a long way between there and successful. What I will tell you is that in the high-tech industry, valuable people, top-notch, really you know, talented people, are very rare. And companies will snarf them up and nail them down. And, and a lot of big tech companies are really good at identifying you. Before you even know yourself how valuable you are, they'll know you are. Those guys get pinned down deep in the heart of Microsoft or Facebook or Google. They get, excuse me, half a million dollars a year to never leave. They never change jobs. They never see the light of day. They get their yacht, their four cars, their nine kids, and they are golden for their entire career, and they're paid whatever they have to to keep them pinned down. They're that valuable. And so one of the interesting things is if you want to be one of those people, then, like I said, I'll tell you how to do it, and it starts with that work ethic and that dependability. Because that rock solidness is what big companies pay nice, big, steady. People like that are just worth gold. Because the problem in the high-tech industry is, of course, you're making complex stuff, right? Everything is complicated now. And if everything is complicated and getting more complicated, how long does it take to train somebody to be expert at some domain in a really complicated space? It takes longer and longer to train them. And yet, high-tech people, because of the amount of training and the IQ and the expertise it takes to handle complex tasks, are really valuable. Which means it's like they're rare, so there's a lot of competition for them. So down in the valley, the turnover rate, down in Silly, uh, sorry, sorry, Washington, you know what the turnover rate for an average Amazon employee is? Nine months. Microsoft, 1.2 years. Down in the valley, similar. Nobody keeps people more than a couple years anymore. The wild tangent when I was running, it was two years, and that was devastating, the turnover rate, the rate at which people flip jobs. Extremely hard to build stable organizations and big technology with people who job hop that rapidly. And one of the sad consequences of it is that if you're right out of college, you're, you know, you've got your degree, you're excited, you have potential, you have talent, you're eager to bring it to work, nobody can afford to hire you, have you be useless, and job hop, and they know you will. So the hardest part about getting in the door in high tech is that they go, look, I hate to say this, kid, but it's going to take us three years. Even though you're brilliant, you're going to bust your ass, I know it. Three years before you're even productive for me. The, the, the stuff we do is so complicated. And you're going to be out of here in six months because the minute you're hired, your job qualified, and some poacher will come up and go, oh, look, I'll pay you double, come over here. And you're going to go, I'm kind of dumb, got to go, sorry. Cool. Another Google, Oracle on my resume. Let's see if I can get Facebook next. So what you would see in the valley is these resumes that are just a list of, and then somebody comes out of college and just job, 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 right? And then, and then maybe two years or so forth, just job hopping, job hopping. And the trouble is in the short term, uh, that's actually a very good strategy for a short-term employee because you can go out there and you can say, okay, once I get in the door, I'll just job hop, negotiate for a slightly better job salary, job hop again, I got a raise, put that company on my salary, negotiate for a slightly better salary over there, get another skill on my list, job hop and build that resume. Uh, and the short term, so you get kids out of college, and if you've got the talent and the skills and you get sought after, you job hop a bunch of times, you get yourself up in that 120, 160 range, and you think you're doing pretty good. Um, and there you stay forever, kind of. But that's essentially how it works down there. And so you see these highly groomed resumes where people put a lot of work into job hopping in just the right sequence to get all the stuff on their resume. And recruiters know this. So when I look at piles of resumes, perfect resume, perfect resume, perfect resume, and all I'm thinking is won't retain, won't retain, won't retain, <laughs> right? Um, and so getting in the door is the hardest part. And if you want to get in the door, 
one of the strongest, there's a lot of things I'll, I'll emphasize to you, but one of the strongest things is what is going to give the employer confidence that they're going to keep you long enough to be worth something. And what I will say to you is that in the short term, that is not in your interest because you could jack your short term salary faster by hopping around. That's true. And I wouldn't even necessarily blame somebody for doing it. However, I will say that if you want to get one of those $500,000 a year jobs that you just are able to show up anytime you like uh, and, and the company is got such a reputation, you're so invaluable and so forth, they keep you forever at a huge salary, um, then that comes from not job hopping. It comes from picking that first company right out of college and writing it all the way up to the CEO. And, or, you know, or frankly, even just always staying in that organization, getting paid a lot to just own your thing that's so huge and complicated they could never train somebody to replace you. It's just cheaper to pay you the nearly seven-figure salary. Uh, and I know a lot of people who, who live that lifestyle, and, and that's not a bad one. Um, not for me, but it's not a bad one. So if you want to be a great wage slave, my two pieces of advice are getting in the door is the hardest part because you're a job, if you're a job hopper, they know what that's worth, and it's worth less than somebody that they're going to retain and keep a long time. Uh, if you uh, want to get rich slow and you want to be a wage slave, then the way to do it is to pick that first job very carefully, get in and gut it out for a long period of time. Uh, if you want to jack your salary up there, do the job hopping thing. And then maybe try to switch roles, but the problem is when you've done the job hopping thing and you get into your 30s, it's much harder to get that senior role than at a Google or a Facebook and entrench it. It's possible still, but it's much harder. Uh, it's, it's easier if you come up through the ranks very often. Uh, and again, not insurmountable. I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the either. All I would say is that there's a trade-off between the job hopping re resume building technique, which has its uh, advantages, and the, the slow and steady approach. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say that um, that you find very problematic these days is that when employers, you know, down in the valley and down on the floor 48, everybody's highly socialized and trained and optimized to get jobs and to be in large organization politicians. So one of the things that was very weird for me working, especially in California, I mean, I was exposed to it in Washington, but it was really clear in California, is you have a population of people. These jobs are valuable. There's a lot of money changing hands. Competition is fierce. So the people who are lucky enough to have the education and the talent and potential to get into these high-tech jobs, you know, they have, they're highly groomed. Their resumes always look right. They always talk right. They look right, right? And, and it is almost a sort of a profile that's familiar. People like sometimes, a lot of organizations specifically like hiring you because you are groomed that way. Uh, but at the same time, if you're an employer, especially at a startup, uh, it's much harder to hire those people because they're very good at being impossible to get to know. So when you want to interview people, one of the hardest things to do in an interview is everybody's nervous on the interview, right? So when you get in and you get down to the interview and people want to talk to you, if you're looking right and always perfectly formal and always have the correct polite answer and make professional eye contact and hold yourself with the correct disposition and uh, always recite the correct answer to the questions that you've been properly conditioned to do, then the employer will be very impressed about what a great professional you are and have no idea if they ever want to work with you because they don't know what you really like. Um, and so one of the challenges is that if you're working for a big organization and talking to the recruiter, that is a good way to be. If you're talking to a startup or talking, interviewing with the managers and employees you'll be working with, that's the wrong way to be. The right way to be in a startup or in front of people you're actually going to be working with is relatively open and relaxed and show your personality. And if your personality is one they like and the one they like to work with, they will hire you and you will like that job. If you do not get that job after you've done that, you didn't want that job. You don't know it, but those people go, I got to know you. I hate that person. If they were in here, we would have a miserable time and they'd quit. Let's just not hire them. So the nice thing is that what I can tell you is that when you do the formally thing, one of the saddest things is when you don't get a call back and you don't know why you're and you don't get hired, you often don't know why. And that's also because it's illegal to tell you. So the nice thing is, I'm not hiring any today. I can tell you why I didn't hire you in advance. And I hire a lot of people. So the number one one in interpersonal situations is I didn't get to know you. You're too polished, too formal, too nervous for me to feel like I got contact or could make a formal relationship with you. And so I don't know if I want to work with you. I can't tell. 
Uh, so one of the things is, is look at the conditions when you're talking to a recruiter or somebody you're not going to be working with, then delivering the formal presentation. Frankly, also, you want to be liked by the recruiter, but being able to show that you're professional and, can, and managed is important in that context. But when you're interviewing with the actual person who's going to employ you or the team you're going to work with, you've got to show who you are, let them get to know you, take some risk. If you don't get the job, don't feel bad. You probably didn't really want it. Okay. So uh, the next thing that uh, we should probably talk about a little bit is, you know, what's your education worth and all that stuff. It's good to get good grades. It's good to have the right degree. That's but what happens is your resume is a is for not for hiring you. Your purpose of your resume is to eliminate you. So the resume's job is for them to go qualification list resume match or not, not match trash. Okay. And a lot of people because they know that get good at cultivating their resume. Again, I'll say I don't recommend that necessarily. Well, um, your purpose of your interview is to do what? See if they want to not work with you. By the time they interview you, you are already qualified for the job. That resume qualified you. So they don't take time. Interviewing is very time expensive. Everybody hates interviewing. So by the time you're at the interview, you are considered qualified for the job, and the purpose of the interview is to disqualify you again. That is, well, we want to know the positive things. Do we want to work with you? But we're actually mostly looking for the negative things that might show in your personality and open dialogue. And so, and the, and the trouble is that so people get so good at hiding that, that they can't qualify or disqualify you in the interview. And that's why I'm saying, truthfully, if you want a job that you're going to like and to be successful at, let them get to know you, take some risk. That's more likely to get you the job and more likely to get you a job you want. Um, and then the flip side is, if you don't get the job, you often know why. If you were open and they got to know you, that you didn't get the job because they didn't like you. You're already qualified, so something else wrong with you. Now, you can agonize over that, but very often it's often just a personality thing. Or you don't know who the other people they were interviewing were that were a better fit from their point of view, no matter what they said. But that's the important consideration. Um, the other thing I will say is the number one most important thing, again, Interviewing with a recruiter is very different from interviewing for a startup or the first people you're going to work with, because recruiters are very formal. They, they interview like robots, whereas your management team really interview you like, is this somebody we want to work with for a long time? Uh, and is this somebody who's going to make our life easier because they're going to do something that's, that's something I don't want to do or I'm not skilled at, they're going to offload for me. That's, I'm excited about that if I think that they're going to be great to take that off my plate and I can spend more time uh, not moving the mouse too much because you know how strenuous that is. Uh, so one of the things that you find when you, uh, uh, when you interview uh, for a lot of these jobs is there's lots of resumes that are perfectly groomed, lots of perfectly trained people. What's the one thing that's going to qualify you for the job you want other than your list of credentials and experience and your education? Fit's important, yeah. But if, let's say there's two. They got three. I got three of you. You're interviewing. Who's going to get hired if you all fit with the team? Person will do it the cheapest. What's that? Person. <laughs> no, they're not going to care about the money. Actually, well, nobody yeah, cares about how much it costs to hire you. That's team quality. Yeah, I like you, Edward. But what's the what personality trait? What's that? I, that already got you in. You run in if you didn't have the skills. Work ethic. I can't tell your work ethic for an interview. Stop your work ethic, I can't figure that out. But you know what? What, what does, what, do, how do people with tremendous work ethics show it? Confidence. They call them back. Persist. Confidence. Passion. People who are excited. They just, I, I just love mopping floors. I hate mopping. What, is that a mop? I have one of those mops in my closet because I just love mopping. Can you visit mine if I mop while we talk? Right? You gonna hire that person to be a janitor? Hell yeah! They love mopping! Right? Passion. That's how you know somebody, you know, I, I don't know what your work ethic is, but if you're really excited about the shit you do, you're probably gonna work hard at it. That's how you tell. So people who are passionate about it. So what employers look for is good indications of what your attitude is toward the thing that you're gonna be working on. Because that's the best way they have of gauging whether you're going to be a workaholic or not, or what that work ethic is going to be. Everybody can talk a good game, but showing passion is usually pretty genuine. It's pretty hard to fake, right? And so, and especially when we talk about the game industry, it's a little easier sometimes. 
Well, what I'm going to tell you is, you know, for a lot of those, let me, see, let me back this up a step. Anybody with the talent and expertise to get a job in the game industry also has the talent and expertise to get paid twice as much at a boring enterprise job. Tell me now. Nobody works in the game industry because they're there for the money. That would be it's stupid. Anybody who can get a job in the game industry is better qualified for twice the money doing a boring job. So the only people who are making games are doing it because they love it. They have the talent and the work ethic, and they love it. And how do you know somebody loves making games? They're passionate about games. And how do you measure passion in a one-hour interview? All they talk about is game stuff. Good, but you know they know it's an interview. They're kind of they're smart people, so bullshit's easy. What else? What's harder to bullshit than an interview? Smile. Smiles, good social cues. That's acting. Personal Those valley people, pretty. What? Experience, personal experience. Personal experience. You mean here's the game I made in my closet when nobody was paying me and it wasn't a homework assignment because I just make games. I just got, look at the game I made. Look, it's got some cubes. It looks like shit, but I've been working on it for ages. I spent six months. I built a thing like this. And hey, look, I've here the ray tracer. So people who actually just make stuff. When you walk into an interview and say, um, I don't have any experience. I just graduated from college and I got some C's in math. But um, here's my crappy clone of Halo I made in my bedroom with my three friends, and we read purpose the art assets, and I wrote a little multiplayer server, and we got it, that did things like this. That employer's going to go, we'll give you a job. I can hire that. So it's in the game industry, the way you show passion, people who are game developers, they just make games. They just do it no matter what. It's just getting paid for its bonus. So one of the things you I look for always is going, yeah, show me what you do because you love it. Tell me about the games or the game thing related to your field that you just do. Because that's the real indication that somebody's passionate about it, is they have a portfolio of stuff they did for no purpose other than they couldn't help themselves. So that's the secret. Okay? You guys believe me? You look skeptical. I'm telling you. So if you want to get into a traditional game company, so a lot of these, uh, there's variations in the game field, but a lot of the game studios are fairly small. And that's what the founders are looking for. Is somebody who's just going, I love making games. I think about making games. I think about game designs. I do stuff. I write game designs. I write game music. I build game code. And I just do it no matter who's paying me. And that's a strong indication that you've got a talent. So I'll give you an example. When I was started Wild Tangent, the market's very competitive. Seasoned engineers with experience are very expensive, and I don't have a lot of money to start up. And computer science degrees, Microsoft's always going to start from for more than I could afford. So I'm going to go, i got to make a company, and i got to recruit some people to build game technology in an entirely revolutionary new way, and i got to find them from a pool that I'm not going to have competition for. So the first game developers I hired were actually web designer kids. Every one of them just, you know, I made some HTML, and I love playing games. I love games, but all I know how to do is write a web page in HTML and little Java, maybe some JavaScript. And so uh, one of the first guys I hired was a guy, a kid named Travis Baldry. Um, grew up in the Midwest, no high school degree, got an art degree from the Seattle Art Institute, and he was the web page designer for the Seattle, uh, what was it? Seattle Seahawks, I think it was, or it was a baseball team, I don't remember, it was a long time ago. Um, and this kid was, you know, he was 21, and his Photoshop artwork was gorgeous. He just had a huge portfolio of stuff he produced, just lots of art he just made for fun. His logos, he designed the first logo for the company, they're all gorgeous. Uh, and uh, when he came into the interview, I said, you know, you know, you like making, you, know, you want to make games? And he said, yeah, he said, I, you know, I, I can't really code. I just, I know a little web script. He goes, I, here's my baseball page, and here's some of my Photoshop portfolio. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, Here's uh, a little DHTML knockoff I did of Ultima. And he brought up a game on the web page that had the characters and swords and the mount mountains and all the AI, all little Java applets and character-based things going, eh, eh, eh. And it was almost a complete clone of, like, one of the early Apple versions of Ultima. He'd almost duplicated the web page. And I was like, what? You, you, I mean, it was crap. But it was a huge amount of work. It really just tried like hell using the crudest tool he had available to knock off Ultima. 
I go, dude, you want to really learn how to make games? He's like, well, yeah, I'd love to. I'm like, All right, I'm going to hire you. <laughs> I can show you how to make a game. If you're just going, I just got to make a game, I think you'll pick up the rest. So that kid went on to, he uh, worked for Wild Tangent for seven years. He cranked out two 3D games a year for me on average, sometimes four, by himself. He did the 3D programming, the engineering, and the art himself, usually. Sometimes near the end, he'd get an extra, we'd make him take an extra artist to help him finish it off. His last game for us was a game called Fate. It was basically a knockoff of a downloadable version of Diablo he built himself in six months. Uh, we forced him to take an art team of six people to finish out all the artwork because he couldn't do it himself. Cloned procedural levels, every level was original, all the assets, everything, he built it himself. It was amazing. Uh, the game became our number one best-selling hit, so just made tons of money. At that time, Walt Andrews was getting so successful that he actually said, we were looking at spin, you know, getting rid of our studios, we don't need to make games anymore, we're just doing great at publishing. So we spun out with all of these other earlier kids who were like him, who just came out of nowhere. One was a submarine programmer, another one was a, a, another, just a website of a fan site. They all left and they started Runic Studios. Runic Studios, they raised $10 million from uh, investors to build their first game, which was called Torchlight. Heard of that game, anybody? Cool. And uh, Torchlight made so much money when they launched it that they paid back their investors and the investors got no equity. The investors, that was not how it was supposed to work out. The way it's supposed to work out is they launch their first game. It doesn't quite succeed enough to pay back the money, so the investor gets a bunch of equity. And then you have to go back and give them more of the company to get more money. These guys wiped their investors out. The game was such a huge hit. They went back and renegotiated a new investment with their investors for even more money on better terms. <laughs> and uh, so they've come out with Torchlight 2. Travis Baldry is the CEO of that company. They're making a mint. It's the same form of all tangent team. All web designers originally, no computer science majors, and they're cranking out top-notch downloadable games. They make a ton of money, and, and they're all very successful. And, haggard and bitter like I am in the old age with old age and experience. So those, I'm very proud of those guys. They really did well, and that's exactly what it took, is they just wanted to make games. So that passion for the field is one of the most important criteria, and generally, again, if you went to a job with EA or a Disney, you're going to get more of the formal recruiter, and does your resume say the right stuff, and do you look the right way? But for the vast majority of the game industry, which is smaller studios and smaller teams, that showing the passion, showing some personality, and showing, showing the work you do on your own because you love it will be far more important to getting you that job. Okay. So with that, are there any questions you guys want to throw at me? Because i got all kinds of material. But the high pass is that, that it's going to be the work ethic first and showing the passion that will get you that job in the door. There's all kinds of things I can tell you about Megalomania if you're interested. But the punchline is getting in the door comes from, and of course, networking. And networking is going, hey, I just want to make games. Pay me anything. I'm off the floor, whatever, get in the door, doing whatever thing that you think is undignified or beneath you. Because game companies, if they got in the, the thing you want to do that you're not prepared for, they can't hire you to do that yet. You've got a huge project worth a lot of money. They can't let you take the risk of screwing it up. They jeopardize the whole company, and now they have to fire you too. They don't want to set you up for failure. So very often to get into a field, you have to take a job where you can't, you go, the expectation is we'd like to bring you along and have you do exactly what you want to do, but we got to bring you in a safe place where you can't do any harm. So one of the things you got to accept or set your pride aside about, especially in the game industry, is whatever gets you in the door is fine. Don't sweat it. That's where that work ethic comes in. Whatever, I want to earn it. Just have that attitude, and you'll do fine. You will. At those companies, if you are talented, talent is rare and valuable. They want to get you doing, they want to give you responsibility. They want to promote you. They want to push stuff to you. They just got to know you can handle it because they can't afford to have you screw up. And so, you know, like I said, if they can if they can find a cheap, safe way to get you in, the way you get in is often completely unrelated to what you end up doing. Just understand that just by getting them, because you got in the door over here, that's going to pitch in your, your career. It's not like that at all. It's just the, the in jobs, the ways to get into testing or to customer support or some of those things that don't sound like what you want to do. That's the way they let you in, get you exposed, get a feel for what kind of person you are, job hop when it isn't critical to a project because we put you over here. You know, all of that is, is the case. So don't don't get your ego too wrapped up in, I got this huge degree and all these qualifications. I, I can't want this job. Why can't I get it? Okay. The reason is they don't know you yet and you haven't proven yourself yet. All right. Any questions? Throw, throw some open subjects at me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so 
you work for Microsoft? Right? Yes, I did. So what do, what do they look for if, if all you can get on the American Paint for an internship? What do they look for? Uh, in which case, so do you have any generally or specifically? Um, Microsoft has changed a little over the years. So I can tell you the answer of what it was when I was there, or I can speculate a little more about what it is today. Okay. So Microsoft has become, so in the hot days, it was very, it was IQ, IQ, IQ. Mm -hmm. These days, they're a lot more of a more formal, traditional company, so their hiring process is interestingly very, very rigorous and very, very structured. So interviewing for a job at Microsoft today is very systematic. And traditionally what they do is they do a lot of interviews because when they, if they get a resume, Microsoft's got so many positions they're filling, mm -hmm. that what they do is they take a look at your resume and they go, okay, of the 2,000 jobs we have open, you know, pick four that this one's the best match for. Oh, there isn't four, probably not worth our time to interview, <laughs> right? Just find several, okay, we got, this was a high match, so if we get this, go through the trouble of coordinating this person, it's highly likely that one of these guys will hire her because she's got very high qualification matching. That's just the way they think. So then they interview, and it's a, it's traditionally is, is a bit of a gauntlet. That is, you meet a lot of people, get a lot of random questions thrown at you. And generally, Microsoft still is, um, it used to be an IQ test. These days, it's probably, excuse me, more like a personality test. So I published on my site some of their early ex management personality profile and interview questions. Those were from the 1990s. Microsoft has, has gotten even more sophisticated in that direction. So although those tools I published aren't probably the same today, don't assume that, that they've discarded that or gotten any less systematic than they were then. They were very systematic. So a lot of what they're looking for is they're going to interview a lot of people, throw questions at you from a lot of different directions. And they're asking themselves, frankly, uh, you know, one, um, is this person smart? Was always a top Microsoft criteria, probably still is. Two, are they going to be a personality fit? Three, because people increasingly move around a lot of Microsoft, frankly, are they versatile? So because Microsoft's always going, you know, if we hire you, we want to keep you as long as we can. So we want your idea to, of promotion or job mobility to be within this company. And for that to be true, you can't really be very specialized and only useful for X. They like it if you seem to show the potential to go, oh, we can drop you here, and if that didn't work or you wanted to change things, you could also be useful over there. So very often they're looking for a certain amount of versatility and psychological versatility. Um, they also have a lot of personality uh, profile traits that they look for. I can talk to the ones in the 90s that probably haven't changed a lot. Um, one of the big ones is high emphasis communication and teamwork. For building big technology, Modern big technology, Microsoft's the most extreme example of this. It's so incredibly complicated, no individual is smart enough to be able to hold it all. It just can't. And so when you're building big tech or running big organizations, communication skills are just incredibly valuable and necessary. And it's real hard to find, especially among the Asperger's nerds like the rest of y'all. Um, I'm only half kidding. So very often, getting people who will communicate, 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 I don't mind writing up what I'm saying, documenting it, over communicating and systematically analyzing things. So very often they're they're really looking heavily for a lot of the strong communication skills are highly valued in bigger organizations. And so very often they're looking for those in addition to sort of some base level skills for the specific tasks you're going to do. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yeah. You know of um, any opportunities in virtual reality? The well, there are obviously quite a few of them. Uh, when you say virtual reality devices, making games, or alternative, re alternative reality stuff in general? Uh, are you talking about the goggles, the gaming, or something in between? The, I guess the whole system. So, so just the virtual reality immersion, I guess. Um, gaming is certainly um, a potential right, possibility, yeah. but, but mostly I'm just interested in in that virtual environment. Yeah, you know, the, let me see if I can phrase this right. What I tell people is I always interested in virtual reality stuff too. The yeah. money for virtual reality is closely tied to gaming. So if you said, so just as a general piece of advice sitting here abstractly, then the answer is yeah, there are some like, you know, Oculus probably be hiring some people. Google Glass probably hires some people. I actually just talking to a virtual reality company that wants me to do some work for them that's making a very interesting alternative reality technology. And with Facebook buying Oculus VR, 
there's probably about to be 10 VC funded alternative or uh, virtual reality startups funded in the valley sometime in the next six months just because Facebook paying $2 billion for Oculus will have created the trend. So there's going to be some of that. If you're asking me career advice on virtual reality, my advice would be stick close to gaming early on. That's where the money is and where the expertise and all the technology you need to learn and master is. So that if the opportunity is specifically in virtual reality that isn't necessarily gaming or open, your resume will be qualified if you've been doing it in the gaming space. Because that's where it comes from and that's where the money is. And you will have more job opportunities and uh, more job security if it's gaming on your resume first rather than virtual reality stuff. What kind of gaming companies then are doing VR stuff? Well, interestingly, a lot of the companies that produce 3D engines and 3D games these days uh, will have a mode that can support the NVIDIA Flicker glasses or the Oculus Rift. So generally, the game designers working on modern engines and games often have the leeway to go, I'd like to make that a feature as part of making the game. And often, it's just probably just the engineer working on it going, I just feel like adding it because it's cool. And game companies often are that way. They just go, hey, that's a neat feature. Let's do it. Or NVIDIA paid us to support it. Or Oculus Facebook paid us to do it. So here, put the VR stuff in. Um, so you find that that's the most tangible, consistent, paying market that gets you there. So if you say, I'm graduating from college and I want to do VR stuff because I like all that snow crash fantasy, I'd say, get into gaming, get into 3D any way you can. And once you get that solidly on your resume, you're going to, you'll see the offer, you'll be connected, you'll be qualified, you'll see the opportunities, you'll be able to get those jobs when they open up because you'll be near them and you'll have the experience that, that makes you qualified for them. Other questions? You know, like um, most of the open source companies, like uh, there's Red Hat, most of their companies <coughs> are based on providing um, tech support. I mean, do you have any uh, experience with uh, the open source companies that I have a little, not a ton. The, um, you know, I'm more of a client guy than, well, weirdly, I'm kind of a, a cloud guy now because I ran a social network, but uh, much more of my experience is on the client operating system side overall. Um, the open source companies are interesting. So the idea like, like Cloudera is one I've been looking at a lot recently because I hated Hadoop. Oh, Hadoop was the worst. Oh, God. The amount of life I wasted Hadooping for data. Um, so Cloudera is a cloud-based open source company, also Red Hat. My VCs at Wild Tangent were also funded and on the board of Red Hat. Um, so the basic thing is we take some open source crap, and then we put some VC money into actually making it not crap, and then provide the vital support and infrastructure to adopt it, and that makes it commercial grade usable for enterprise purposes. Um, so the question is, how do you get jobs in that area? It's going to, you know, I'm speculating, but very often those companies are VC funded, so they're going to look like a lot of Silicon Valley startups. And very often, they're going to be looking for um, people who have got tricks. So if you, let's say that you're, think that you're, you're interested in Cloudera, if you are donating code, if you are signed up as a registered developer on Hadoop and contributing code to the Hadoop build, those are probably the first guys they hire. So rule of thumb is, and coming from my field, we did the same thing when I ran open source stuff for our web driver. A lot of our first coaching, we went, who's up there active on the forums, doing really cool stuff and working hard and being part of the community and, and, and contributing code that's useful? That's who we shop for resumes. And that's the first place I'd go, is I'd get up there and go, I'm doing, I'm contributing to Hadoop, and I'm a registered developer, and I'm submitting stuff that's getting approved. That's going to get you in there. Other questions? All right. I can ramble into the subjects. Yes, on. Uh, earlier you were talking about your own experience that when you started working at um, Wild Tangent, you started wearing these different hats, the business hat, yeah. the marketing hat, the economist hat. Yeah. Uh, someone in college, they're you know, perhaps a CS student, drilling down in the technical to go. Would you recommend diversifying a little bit, like getting your background? Like taking yeah, the, course and visiting or what do you think? The thing I try to be careful about in these kinds of conversations is I know that I'm fairly unique in my particular personality properties and other people have, there's a very wide range of interests and skill sets that people have in their careers. So I'm trying to, I want to try to give you guys advice that's really relevant to what you want to be rather than what was relevant to what I wanted to be. Because I want to be a megalomaniac that rules you all. I don't give a mild laugh like that. I think he means it. I do. <laughs> um, so I know what I am and I understand my particular skill set. So, you know, 
in the megalomaniac in me says, yeah, you better know everything, you better do everything, you better be able, you know, I had a guy I worked with who was a lot like me at Microsoft, and the yelling conversations he had with, with you know, wage slaves who uh, weren't very broad or functional, he goes, look, I'm your manager, I'm supposed to, I suck at all of this, and I can do this specific task you're hired for better than you, look, and then you do it, idiot, why am I paying you when I am less qualified than you, and I can do a better job than you? Now, of course, that's a very old Microsoft asshole way to be, but there are people out there who have that kind of skill set, so if you're going to be a specialist, you'd better be really good at it. Don't be a mediocre specialist. That's job insecurity right out of the gate, because um, you will encounter uh, in the high tech people like that. They've risen to very senior, like uh, a guy who was not like Eric, actually, is John Ludwig, who ran Windows for Workgroups development, and he ran development of Internet Explorer at Microsoft. Guy was really interesting to me because he was an engineer nerd. He's just like me. I'm going to go see him in a week or so. Um, just loves programming, loves the technology, and ends up managing a thousand person organization when he'd really rather just be coding. Didn't like managing people at all, but he was so freaking good at it. Uh, and he was, you know, and he kind of just dealt with it like programming. So the guy had a very interesting personality type because he's an exceedingly good manager for large, complex engineering when you know that all day long all he wanted to do was code. Um, and so the interesting thing about it is you, you're constantly, you mentioned you're constantly reminded that this guy not only could probably outcode you, but he also could run a thousand person organization. Um, and that that, that skill set, and again for him it was probably just genetic, just a personality trait. He didn't go to school, didn't want to be management, he just kept getting promoted because he was just really useful at that. So very often you'll find that those skill sets, if you have them, the organization will discover them and promote you into them, and maybe against your will. <laughs> They'll just go, I'll just pay you more to do this, even though that's what you want to do, because you're actually good at this and don't know it. Uh, so you, you can find that that happens quite often at a lot of different levels in an organization. But it comes to being, so I can't tell people, hey, be generalists, because being a generalist is hard. It's, it's a lot of, frankly, for most people, it's genetic. What I can tell you is that work ethic is universally valuable. I can just, that's great advice, key advice. Low pride, dig in, get it done and finish in, will always guarantee you job security and your choice of jobs. It just works. So that's the first one I'll press on you. The second one I'll press on you for big technology and complex organizations is team or organization communication and coordination skills. Big complex stuff can't be made by individuals anymore. It takes a huge amount of coordination to get these things to happen which is a really complex mix of social and people skills and technology acumen to understand it all. And a really weird and valuable skill set is the person who can go, look, I can't understand way down here at the lowest level what you're doing, but I am really good at identifying the smallest subset of what your job is or what needs to be done to make a correct, efficient decision about how to structure an organization and how to build things. And so if you go up the food chain to technology producers and program managers and so forth, you find these people often who, maybe they, they often weren't the best engineer in their career. And I was actually, I was, I have, I've had a lot of interesting conversations with women graduating from school, and they have a lot of concerns about entering the field, many of which, interestingly, are imaginary. Um, because, you know, they're like, well, I'm a girl, and I got a computer science degree. I just don't know. I'm going to compete with all the boys, because they don't assume girls are the best programmers and so forth. I go, well, first of all, honey, <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of guys do not want to work together in a sausage fest. A bunch of nerds going, God, it'd be nice to have some girls around here. It really <laughs> sucks. So anytime that if, if somebody gets a computer science degree, a qualified computer science degree from a, a, a woman, they're going to get first dibs. It's going to go to the top of the stack. So if you're a woman in high tech and you've got technical skills, that is, they're not going to go, oh, broad. She can't code. They're going to go, oh, thank God. Let's just, let's say you can just, let's put her in. Qualifications suck, but let's just try maybe the personality, teamwork, whatever, because we hope so. And the other thing that happens with women is that because those management skills, great engineers, I hate to say this, great engineers often exhibit a lot of Asperger's symptoms. I mean, they just, I can't talk, and I can't have mumble, and I really don't want to deal with people. And it's really just, a, it's not a stereotype, it's true. Uh, and so some of the best engineers will never make good managers. They, and they're preferred, they just, I don't want, just tell me what to do, and I'll just, just shut the door, please, on your way out, 
right? And so very often what organizations love getting is women with those qualifications, and they may expect, hey, these women, they got a CS degree, which is very interesting and cool that they got one. Maybe they're not going to outperform these male Asperger engineers at being compulsive 14-hour-a-day programmers, but oh, thank God we've got managers for them. So very often, not only do they want to have women in the organization just because nobody wants just a bunch of guys in a dark room, they'd like love to mix it up, but second, women are very often a very good balance of technical acumen with social skills, and so you'll often very quickly see them moving into management roles. Uh, and funny enough, the engineers are like, yeah, give it to her because I just want to be left alone. Um, so interestingly, actually, in the in the in most of the high tech space, that's why I tell my daughters, I just 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 get a computer science degree. It doesn't matter if you hate it or you're a lousy programmer. Now, of course, my daughters will be brilliant ones, <laughs> but the interesting consequence is you will be hugely valuable and your job will be secure just because they'll go, oh, thank God, we've got a generation of potential managers here. And we can hire them because they can do some coding, could be some use for that. But even if that's really not their thing, even if they're going to end up coordination communicating, we really need that. So you also see that in the game industry a lot, where they'll just go, boy, if we can just find a chick gamer, a nerd chick who just loves playing games, right, but has these social skills that the nerds don't, then she's in charge of producing it. Because you know, I had one, uh, Tanya Royer, right, now producer of PopCap, I think. She's one of my favorites at Wild Tangent because we had these advertising projects, just pain in the ass customers, complex projects. They had to be delivered on a short time frame. Uh, some of them, because they were for like Axe deodorant, they were really sexy, they had some political correctness issues with them, right? And so we had to do motion capture with dancers and stuff like that. We just go, Tanya, this is your job. Go deal with the shouting customer, deal with the strippers who have to do the mocap for the Axe commercial, and deal with the engineers, because we don't want them near the strippers, to <laughs> actually write the Axe deodorant game, right? And Tanya was just like, I had got it under control. Um, and so, you know, for women entering this field, they're actually very valuable. So one of the things I just I tell, you know, all the people, like, you know, girls, you want a great secure job, you want your choice of jobs, you, you don't have to go, oh, yeah, I want to code all day. It's okay. Get a technical degree. Get the skill set. There's lots of demand for management. A lot of the folks here are going to be hopefully getting uh, that first interview, the first job of uh, months or years from now. Could you give them an idea of like danger signs in management to look for and when to go to the other team or, um, yeah. or the other company? Yeah, you know, I'm going to say something strange to that respect. I don't care. The, the first goal, your first goal in the industry, get your first job. And frankly, get it on any terms you can. There's going to be, as, as Dan correctly points out, lots of potential mistakes. And if you're one of the really valuable people, you got the right qualifications, you're highly sought after, the key thing, actually here's, here's the good advice to give you on that front, which is that if you really want your choice of jobs, you've got to approach or, or, uh, getting them in parallel. So getting them in parallel means get your resumes out in a fairly tight batch. Get your, try to group your interviews in a fairly close batch. Right? Um, try to keep, keep it concentrated. Do your networking in a fairly dense batch. So that what you, what you hopefully get is multiple opportunities to choose between. If you can orchestrate multiple opportunities at the same time, that is, I expect to get three job offers this week, then you really get your choice. And then you can ask that question, ah, manager made me dodgy, I think I'm going to go over here. Um, if you don't have, haven't done that, or you're not for whatever reason, the market isn't that way, or your skill set isn't that way, if you just have a job or not a job, my advice is get in. Get in, because the minute you're in, your ability to, and again, I hate to say it, but once you've been hired once in high tech, the ability to job hop is a lot easier on the inside. So my attitude is, um, you know, if your choice is between unemployment and getting into the tech industry, get yourself in because the act of getting you in gives you options. So if you are in Fairbanks, Alaska, you're possibly a CS student, and devices to get in, it's a geographic problem. Yeah. Is that a problem? Well, how to address it? Yeah, well, it's simple. Who, who wants to run a startup? Start here. You've got lots of talent and no employees and a great cost basis. So stay in Alaska, start a company. How many of you uh, want to get a job in gaming and high tech? Move to California, Washington. Move or work for that guy. <laughs> no, serious, right? The, uh, the jobs are down there. Um, uh, the, uh, the market is, in, when you get to the Washington, the, on both coasts, but particularly the West Coast, 
competition is very fierce. So if you want to have that big, fast-paced career and so forth, we can make some, talk about some life stuff too, which might be fun. But if you want to have that big, high, highly sought-off, uh, you know, high-tech career, you got to go down there. Um, if I were Alaskan and entrepreneurial, I would absolutely do it here. I would do it here because it is so expensive and competitive for talent that if I could justify camping outside the University of Alaska, setting up an office and having first dibs on you guys, I would absolutely do that. Give me a huge advantage. Because down in California, you guys are going to be making triple what you're going to make up here. Um, so if I were an entrepreneur, I'd start here. If I were looking to get, get a tour in high tech, I'd get my butt down there. But let's mix that with a little life stuff. You know, I love Alaska. Um, I could never have had the career that I had here. But I love it here. You know, some people would want to come back. If you're looking at sequencing things in life, you know, one of the things Owen and I were talking about is the interesting question of balance, right? People go, well, I got a wife and I got kids now, and I know that it's not work. I know Alex told me it's not work to sit on my ass and move a mouse all day, but sometime I need to go home and spend time with my family because I can't mix those two together very well. Um, and one of the things I said to Owen is, yeah, I know it's very tough. If you're starting out graduating from college, here is the correct way, or here's the best way to sequence your balance in life, in my opinion. Get in the door, work your ass off 100 hours a week. Kill yourself those early years. Move up, make as much money as you can. The consequence of establishing yourself in a highly qualified job is exceedingly valuable, is that you will be paid a ridiculous sum of money to work 40 hours a week or on any terms you like because some valuable institutional part of the organization became dependent on you and you were too valuable and consistent and reliable to replace and then you could live a more balanced life, get married, have kids. If you want to move to Alaska and live and have kids, then go do that at a startup, get your stock options, get that sucker to flip for half a billion, take your money, move back to Alaska and live happily ever after doing whatever the hell you like. Um, and the nice thing is if you're young and you have choices ahead of you, you can consciously choose that stuff. A lot of people come in, you know, life is complicated, things mix up, family, you fumble around, and, and that often shapes your career a lot. But if I was, say, recommending efficient paths for, for you know, high-tech careers, my, frankly, my advice is while you're young and single, go kill yourself. Just go bust your ass and just do that and don't have any balance other than busting your ass and succeeding because that will buy you the seat at the table you want to have either to get a lot of money in stock options and to be able to retire young, which is really neat when you can do it, and a lot of people do that, or to have a very high-paying, consistent job that doesn't have those demands of you anymore because you moved into that kind of role, you drilled yourself there. And that's absolutely a practical option as well. I'm getting a look for Amanda. You don't like that advice, Amanda? No, I'm cheering you. It's all good. I'm just, it's just the reality of it, right? Uh, like I said, you can be mediocre, work for 40 hours a week, and there may be options for you. I'm just saying... Because I'm a megalomaniac, I'm always looking for how do I get the most of what I want, not just a pretty good job or a pretty good arrangement. You're just ruining Owen. That's all I'm on good. I'm sorry. Well, Owen's already, he's already gone, over man. the hill married and done. He's not going to get his computer science degree now. <laughs> this is not applicable to him. Yes? So do you have any advice on managing somebody who has both Asperger's and is a megalomaniac? <laughs> no. I have had my sins revisited upon me many times. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, you'd have to be more specific, but the Asperger's people I'm very comfortable managing. You just gotta, you know, the funny thing is, you know, society weirdly thinks it's a disease. I like, I'm recruiting for it. Boy, I, last thing I need is an engineer to have a girlfriend, because that's really cuts into their productivity. <laughs> um, and if they have a wife, boy, you go, I need you to work 90 hours a week, and she'd actually like to see you sometime, and so I'm in the, uh, you know. Um, so the Asperger guys are great because really all they want to do is code and work and code, so I'll just hire them. Just come right in. Here you go. Here's your computer, computer keyboard. I'll see you in a week. Um, so managing them often, they have certain personality traits. I don't know if you want to reveal the particular ones you have. And I don't know, are you married to one or is one your son? <laughs> I know, I know. Not. Are you sitting next to him right now? <laughs> He's not my son. <laughs> <laughs> Just hypothetically. Yeah, the, uh, well, how do you phrase it? Um, the uh, Asperger's, the, the condition my daughter is extreme at it. My father's got an interesting case of it. I'm probably something, I've got the gene in some mutant form. Um, the condition is an a inability to separate important from unimportant information, often due to latent development of the hippocampus, which plays a role in deciding what memories are worth storing and which ones are not. 
And a lot of people with various Asperger's or idiot savant syndrome, they can focus on some incredibly boring, tedious, methodical task and never get tired of it because that's just infinitely fascinating and, and it never registers as boring to them. And so people were that way, I'm that way, I just can't stop. So, you know, I was uh, fortunate to uh, marry a woman who goes, I get it. You, I understand that you just need to compulsively work and, you know, I'm happy to spend time with you when you're available for that. And of course, I try to recognize I've got that condition and, and say, hey, honey, I'm sorry that I'm spaced out all the time, but let's go do something anyway. I just thought it may take a while to shake it off. Um, but usually most of them do not have the ability to do anything like that. They just like that. And you just got to realize that it's not voluntary when they're that way. Um, and then if they're maybe in the mind, <laughs> If they're megalomaniacs, that often actually, frankly, makes them difficult. I was an incredibly difficult employee, and some of the ones I've had to work with, some of them are nice and docile and just love to work all the time. Some of them are pretty difficult and argumentative. Um, and that's where uh, the, the uh, uh, mom figure producers work very well. I'm just saying. Because if you, if you put them up against another engineer, they argue all the time. If you put them up with somebody less technically qualified who's just trying to manage them, they just run them over. It's got to be somebody they respect and not for technical reasons. So frankly, if you have a producer who treats acts like, a producer who acts like mom relative to them, then they drop into the yes mom role pretty efficiently, and I'm quite happy when that happens. So that's what I always loved about Tanya. Was she was very good at getting a bunch of engineers to go, oh yeah, whatever mom wants. Uh, and that was just great. You go. <laughs> that's That worked fine for me. Um, yeah, they are difficult, and you know, like I said Microsoft was full of them. They tend to be very argumentative, bullheaded, hard to train. Sometimes, if I had young ones, I'd bring in an older, more seasoned, more bullheaded one to train them, and maybe break them down a bit. And that's usually what helped me a lot. But there's no easy way. But the Asperger guys—they're the most prolific. They're the ones that are going to think about a problem, solve it, never get sick of it, get it done. That's what it takes to produce technology these days. So they're very valuable. Those guys. Weirdly, some, you know, actually, here you want the wife advice. I'll tell you exactly what to do for your Asperger's man. Ready, women? Here's what it is. They're so happy to nerd out at the job they have, they wouldn't dream of asking for a raise or changing it. And very often, they're a lot more valuable than they realize. So I know a lot of these guys who, they just get a job, and they just get lost in the woodwork, and, sh and, and like, you know, some of these guys I know are Blizzard geniuses. They'd be 160, 225 grand off the chart if they job shopped. They never job shop. So if you want to be the wife and you've got one of those, you go, hey, honey, let's just get the resume out there once in a while. Let's just get you in a couple interviews. And nah, I know you love your job. Just We're just going to get you to an interview once in a while. If somebody offers you twice the pay, I know you love the job you're at. Just tell your boss that and get the raise and then go back to work. So I'm serious. So, I just, so I've actually coached a lot of wives. I, go, I hate to tell you this, but your husband's worth a lot more than he realizes. He's not going to act on his own behalf just because he's that way. Here's what you do to get the salary jacked. Actually, here, you guys want some fun advice? You want to know how to jack your salary up in a good way? Would you like the CEO founder's advice for the correct way to not be a job hopper and get your salary escalated? Yes. yes. All right, I'll tell you how this is done. And it works great. And that's funny, I've, got, I've done this for friends and wives. They all just think I'm a miracle worker. Like, I should be doing positive reinforcement. I go, look, it's actually obvious if you think about it. But it just works. So the key is, it's the same for raising money in a lot of things. It's just a sales tactic. I'll say, you're at your job, and I don't think I paid enough. So if one of the things people commonly do is just, they're just pissed off. I just, my boss doesn't appreciate me, and I'm mad, and I'm sad, and I'm sulky, and I'm going to go home early because I'm not paid what I think I'm worth, right? You're paid exactly what you're worth. You are always paid exactly what you're worth. And the only thing you do by adopting that attitude is screw yourself and make yourself worth less. So if you think you are worth more, here's exactly how you find out. You take your resume, you put it out there to all the places you think will pay you more. And you go and interview with those places, and you see who will pay. And you ask for that number you think you're worth. Oh, you'd like to hire me? Well, I want $95,000 a year and a parking spot. And if they give it to you, then you're worth it. And if they don't give it to you, you're not. Wouldn't it be Get if they yourself. give it to you, you're worth at least that much? Because they conceded to that. So well, you probably ask for more. You are, I see you're one of those. <laughs> Allow me to say, feel free to accept that proposition. All we have established is that you have found at least what the known market value for you is at. And I have, I have a different variation of this, like given the VC side, which is having emotional sulkiness over whether you think you're paid fairly or not is 
is a very irrational and self-destructive thing for an employee to do. It does not help you. It helps you fail. If you want to be successful and you think you're worth more, go find somebody who will pay you more. <coughs> and then, what do you do with that after you've got that offer? Yeah, well, you're awesome. You go to your employer and you say, hey, I really love it here. It's a great company, but I've got an offer for a lot more. But I kind of be foolish of me to mistake because it is for a lot more money. But I'd love to stay. Will you guys match this offer? If they won't, goodbye. 90% of the time, they will. And you stay. How long do you stay? So you're not going to match the next offer. When's the next offer? When you go searching. And some of the interesting ones, let's come to when we're promoted until you get the next offer. They're all right. The answer is if you're trying to build, so there's a way to job hop and jack your salary efficiently without looking like a job hopper and damaging your reputation. So I'm going to tell you a relatively optimal way to achieve both. The way you do it is you go to a job, you work there two years, you shop your resume, and you try to get two or three better offers. You take the two or three better offers to your manager and say, hey, I got a better offer to work somewhere else. I'd like to stay. And, and you, like I said, if you hate the company and you want the hell out of there, then I guess you do it. But the smart thing to do if you don't hate the, if there isn't a really an active reason to hate your current job, you may like this other thing, it may be exciting, but from a career point of view, what I suggest doing, if there isn't a reason to get the hell out of there, is to say, I love it here, but I, you know, I've got this other offer, you guys want to match it. Most of the time, they will. And you stay one more year. Do not jack your management after they've met your offer. They get the value for having your integrity as an employee is to give them at least one more year. At that point, you never jack them again. You can negotiate it again on a raise, but it's a different thing. You don't have to go, when somebody wants to promote you to a new role of responsibility, the fact that they're saying, we want you to do this job, you can negotiate without having to have a counteroffer. But when you, the points at which you go and job shop and say, will you match this offer, have to be wisely chosen to manage your relationship with your employer and your reputation. So if you go, I stay one more year. Then after that year, you say, now your employer now knows you're going to do this if you want. They know that you can get a better offer if you come to them. So you don't have to blackmail them again that way. And you never want them to feel like you did because that's what makes bad feelings. You just got to go, hey, I love it here. I want to stay. Here's the other offer. You can do that roughly once a year if you need to. But the blackmail of going and say, I actually job shopped and then found it, you really only want to do once. The second time, if you're not happy and you feel like you can get more from another offer, you don't give them the option to retain you, you leave. Okay? Because even if you go, I got a, I did it a second time, I got a second offer, and I want you to match it, and you do that within a year, they're going to start feeling like they can't trust you, like you're looking, always looking for the door, and they really got a plan to replace you, which doesn't help you. But if you do that once, you just say, hey, and you can always do it once for free. So my advice is stay on the job two to three years uh, at least um, if you can, and then change job without the option. You can use the I've got a better offer once, and then you've got to give them a year after you do that, and then I don't recommend you use it a lot frequently after that. But if you're at a company 10 years, there may be other windows, but the rough formula is two years at a company, I've got counter offers where you meet, meet this and raise it, stay another year, and then you make a decision um, if, whether you're going to stay there or whether you're going to hop. But at three years on the job, looking pretty good in the valley. Early on, earlier in your career, three years, two to three years looks good. You know, six months looks bad, very concerning. Uh, when you start getting up in your career in your 30s, five to seven years looks good. You know, under three to four years doesn't look good, looks a little weak. So if you're looking for kind of roughly whether somebody thinks you're a job hopper, whether you're going to be reliable if they hire you, that's just a good indication. But that technique of doing the get the job, stay on it two years, and then one, get competing bids and see if somebody will match it, and then stepping it up. And, and be coolly rational about it. It's nothing personal. The company pays you the least they have to to keep you. It's not personal. Nothing to get mad about. The only person to be mad about your compensation is you. If you can't get somebody to pay you more at a different job, you're not worth it. Instead of being mad about not being paid fairly, think about what you can do to make yourself more valuable so you can get the compensation you want. That's a much more practical and productive attitude to adopt to getting the career you want to have. Disgruntled employees are useless and toxic, and, and it damages. If people sulk their way out of an organization, 
that results in bad reviews, it results in bad reputation. The problem in the Valley is it's not, the damage that's done to your reputation isn't when the recruiter calls over company and says, hey, should we hire this person? Nobody does that anymore. They call people who know you and just ask about you, and it's done casually and informally. So what are the people and the coworkers you have? What are the friends of the recruiter know about you? Because they're very efficient at finding that out. And if you left on bad, sulky terms, that's what they're going to hear. And they're not going to want one of those. So a toxic employee is very dangerous. Don't be one of those guys. If you're unhappy about your comp, find somebody who will pay you more or improve your skills, but don't let it get up in your head. Don't let it affect the way you view your job or the way the employer is treating you. If you're worth more, you can get a better job somewhere else. Okay? Yeah? How does that affect your relationship with the companies that you went and interviewed at and rejected their offer? Does it affect it really at all? That just makes them like you more. So, when you hand, so the key thing is when you go and interview companies, you just say, you know, you say, hey, I'm interested in the position here. It's exciting. I'm looking at an opportunity. But I've got some other opportunities. You, in the valley where you're competitive, you know, I hate to say it as an employer because I just go, oh, God, right? But they understand. You say, hey, look, I'm, I'm interviewing for a number of jobs. Uh, I've got a couple offers coming through that i got to make a decision in the next couple of weeks. So I think your company's very interested and exciting. But don't make them any promises. But what you want to do is get an offer in hand from somebody. Now, the thing to watch, though, is that companies are smart about that, so they try not to get you the offer in hand. But you know, the key is to try to get something in writing. Give me an offer in writing for what you're offering me. We're, we're a little bit over oh, time. We've got enough time for one or two more questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think sort of in reference to that, what about to the time that you're doing that to give like a counter for a salary negotiation? Oh, you went to the other company that you're interviewing. Do you, I'm just searching around. Maybe you say, like, well, I'm with this company right now, but. You know, the, it really depends on you and the particular conditions. My general advice would be that you, it's perfectly fine to say, hey, I've been at this company for a couple of years. Um, it's a great job, but I'm looking at moving to something else. I've always been excited in this space, so I'd like to look at this particular job because it looks like a lot of fun. Then you're, gonna, you're still always going to get asked when you've got an existing job, well, why are you leaving? And so having that answer, and, and they're going to check, especially if it's, if it's a fast job change. So frankly, if you job shop by, in, sorry, it's a lot of information. Let me try, try to articulate this clearly. The best way to go about this is that down in the valley, the recruiters hunt you down in droves like locusts. So having your resume up on your LinkedIn page and on the game, the four, various correct forms will cause them to call you. And then you're in a position to go, yeah, I'll talk about it. Let's, let's do an interview. And then it's not on you. Yeah. Um, if you have to actually go and say, hey, please interview me, then yes, there is some implied commitment to take a job if they offer it to you, and that does look worse. So uh, to be absolutely fair, the best way to have that outcome happen is to put yourself out there in all the various forms on LinkedIn and have the recruiters come to you. And, and when the valley's hot, it's, that will happen very actively, very often. And then again, with your employer, you also do the same thing. You say, if you want to raise, you know you're working, you've got to use your judgment, you know your work environment. If you've been there a while, you know the way that raises and things are handed out, then if you think that just asking should be sufficient, then you have that conversation with your employer. If you think it's very tight, very tough, or it's going to take leverage, or it's outside their policy, and yet you think you're really worth it, then you decide to use leverage. But of course, you, because that leverage should only really be used once in a near window of time, uh, you want to be very selective about how you use it. But it does work very efficiently. So you mentioned LinkedIn, and I'm wondering, um, you hire a lot of people. How seriously do you approach the resume versus the social media formats? Of, you know, yeah, of it's presence? it's really changed changed a lot, and it changes fast. So the first thing I'll say is that recruiting is very automated, and there's lots of money in recruiting. So these recruiters get paid huge commissions, it's like selling a house to hire you. Uh, and so you should remember that when recruiters are contacting you, they're looking to get a commission. Uh, and one of the challenges these days, so I will say a couple things. One, all modern recruiters will really heavily rely on LinkedIn. Um, they have very powerful tools. They, you know, so using the job tools in LinkedIn tend to be recruiters will come hunt you down if you've got the right attributes and, and they can reach you. Um, so a lot of the recruiters I knew at High Five were all about cultivating a huge network of LinkedIn people. Um, the other thing they're always trying to do is find people who know people who can refer them. So they'll go, hey, Alex, I need somebody with your qualifications, but I know you're taken. Do you know anybody else like you you can name? So I constantly get passed through requests and so forth. So that's where your network becomes quite important. So we'll talk about, let's talk about briefly the various modes. So one, keep your LinkedIn current, keep your Facebook current, 
Um, there are other tools, social tools, because I haven't had to look for a job in years, so I'm not. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had to use the other side, but there's certain tools where getting your resume up there and, and well represented with your experience and keeping it current is very valuable. I certainly just go with LinkedIn and Facebook as the two obvious ones. I think there are others I've heard about, but I just I don't use them myself. Um, the second one is your network. So if you're living in those communities, and that's why again I hate to say it, but it's where it's high base is you go down there, you live in those communities. The communities are very close. Because people job hop fast, the friends move around fast in the roles and positions. So that first company you get, see those 10 people around you, some of whom you hate? If they don't know you hate them and they job hop, they're going to be your next employer or create the next job opportunity for you. So be careful about who you, uh, who you don't like working with because you'd be shocked at well, some of the roles of seniority that some of these people will end up with very quickly as they move around in the industry. So one of the things uh, I found learned the hard way is, um, as much as I like enjoy alienating people, it's really unproductive, <laughs> um, and, and it's so much fun too. Uh, so what you find down there is maintaining those networks and social contacts. The few job hoppers will move up, they'll move to positions of authority. There'll be huge commissions on hiring or coaching people, and they'll call you up and go, "Hey, you want to join too? Because I want to. I want that promotion cut." And that's often a direct way into a new job. So that network of relationships in the industry is really valuable after you've gotten that first job. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, for those of you who would like to continue.